This is J.R. Chadwick, and I am continuing to debunk the Evidence for Young Earth series posted by Nephilim Free. This video will take the task part two of said series. When we last left our creationist friend, he had moved off from biology and begun to butcher astronomy. There is nothing intrinsically wrong with discussing topics outside of one's own field. In fact, to be an evolutionary biologist, you would also need a working knowledge of geology, meteorology, volcanology, and chemistry at least. To discuss the age of the Earth, Surtees would have to go beyond biology, because biology is a terrible field to find the age of the Earth. This was illustrated earlier by his biological proofs, the human population growth rate and the amount of skeletal remains. The problem I have is, Surtees does not seem to have done any research before speaking on astronomy, or anything for that matter. Instead, he has taken the fragments of information he has acquired and filled in the gaps with his own simplistic assumptions. Actually, I should not call them his own assumptions. These have been tattered by creationists longer than I have been alive. I am kind of sick of this guy. After this video, I may not bother debunking the other four videos. At least not until I have gotten some other videos done. So the average life of a comet is only several thousand years, depending how often it comes past the sun. Something like Halley's Comet comes every 80 or so years. But after a while, it's going to actually all boil away and have nothing left. So the average life of a long period comet, not the short period comets, there's, a, there's another family of comets called the short period comets that go around very quickly in a couple of years, rather than long period comets which go around maybe tens of hundred, uh, to a hundred years. The average life is only going to be about a thousand years. So okay, here's his first mistake, giving an average lifespan for comets. Comets are comprised of ices and rock. As a comet approaches the sun in its highly elliptical orbit, the ices begin to sublimate into a corona and a tail which always points away from the sun. However, the life expectancies he gave are utter nonsense. Their lifespans vary considerably for different reasons. Their orbital periods range from just a few years to hundreds of thousands of years. Clearly a comet which only approaches the sun once every 100,000 years will have a lifespan of greater than a few thousand years. Some comets have open orbits. Once they pass the sun, they head off into interstellar space never to return. Comets vary in size as well. Most of them are no larger than 6 kilometers, although some have been discovered to be as large as 40 kilometers. I do not know where he got those ridiculous numbers from. I also must comment that it is very bizarre that this creationist seems to accept the life expectancy of certain comets, however flatly denies the dating techniques of the rest of the solar system. An astronomer by the name of Oort got around the problem by saying, well actually we've, he suggested the Oort cloud is a source of the long period comets. Here have a diagram of what he th thinks the Oort cloud looks like. And out to about one light year, you have what's called the Oort cloud. It's basically a cloud of comet-sized objects in a spherical shell around the sun. And every now and then, a passing star just perturbs the gravitational field slightly, and one of these comets drops in towards the sun. So they could come from any direction. You need a constant source of these comets because they only last for a few thousand years maximum. But it's never actually been observed. It's a very interesting phenomenon, and some astronomers have made a comment in, in the scientific literature that here we have an object that's never been observed, or a phenomenon that's never been observed, which is cited in the literature over and over again to explain the origin of comets. So is that scientific? Well, not very. What a pile of crap. Okay, here's how this creationist believes the idea of the Oort cloud came about. No, oh, gee, these comets would only last a few thousand years. How can we possibly explain them without saying God did it 6,000 years ago? Uh, let's just assume that there's a big sphere of comets that keeps supplying new ones. We'll also claim that it is too far to see, so they won't ask for, uh, for proof. Great! Evolution's been saved again! Yay! Here's how the theory of comets has developed. It goes back to nebular theory. Nebular theory, when it was first contrived, fit well with what was observed at the time, such as the division of the two types of planets, terrestrial planets in the inner solar system and Jovian planets further out, and why nearly all of the mass of the solar system orbits and rotates in the same direction. It also explained why the asteroids in the asteroid belt are quite old and organized between Mars and Jupiter. Comets are made mostly of hydrogen compounds, i.e. methane, ammonia, water, etc. These compounds cannot solidify in the vicinity of the terrestrial planets. Therefore, they must have formed near the gas giants. The high gravity of these planets would have kept the comets from becoming very large. And nebula theory predicted that the further comets would have been pushed into a belt beyond the orbit of Neptune. And starting in 1992, what was discovered? A large band of comet-like objects in orbit around the sun beyond the orbit of Neptune. A huge discovery in favor of nebula theory. 
The nebula theory also predicts that the comets that formed closer to Jupiter would have been flung out in many different directions. Some achieved es escape velocity and continued to drift away into interstellar space. Billions of them, however, would remain in a roughly spherical field at a great distance from the rest of the solar system, known as the Oort Cloud. The oddly tilted orbits of the known long-period comets are statistical proof of the existence of the Oort Cloud. In the same manner as the Kuiper Belt was predicted before it was ever observed, it is almost certain that once our astronomical observation technology advances far enough, we will have visual proof of the Oort Cloud. Hypotheses that both explain what is currently observed and correctly predict future discoveries become theories. So we have, a, we have a problem if you have an old solar system, where do all the comets come from? And the, the, uh, the alternative uh, hypothesis is, well actually, the comets aren't that old, so therefore there's still plenty of them left. If that's a hypothesis, then Ken Hovind's a scientist. That last statement is on par with his statement about solar eclipses. Blatant false dichotomy fallacy. He offers absolutely no proof for his idea. The faint sun paradox. Now, if the sun is a main sequence star, which most people accept that it is, don't have much problem with that, a main sequence star has a lifetime, on conventional terms, of 10 billion years. This is the astronomical uh, accepted theory. So the, the sun is going to last for about another 5 billion years, so don't worry too much. Once again, you cherry-pick the facts you agree and disagree with based on what directly contradicts your insane belief. You cannot disagree with the current age of the sun and accept the, the predicted life expectancy. They were deduced using the exact same science. He would know this if he even had the rudimentary understanding of solar dynamics that I do. But then again, it is so much easier to disagree with something when you don't know a damn thing about it. <clears throat> so it's about four and a half to five billion years old, if the evolutionary story is correct. Which means about half the hydrogen in the sun is now being used up and it's been converted into helium, which gives... Ugh, you're a moron. Half the sun is now helium? Apparently, this guy does not understand the convection of our sun either. Stars can only fuse hydrogen in their cores because that is where temperature and pressure are high enough. Low-mass red dwarf stars have very deep convection zones, which replenish the core with hydrogen from the outer layers. This is part of the reason they last so long. Larger stars, like our sun, have shallow convection zones, so their cores are never replenished. Most of the hydrogen of our sun will never undergo fusion. The correct makeup of our sun is 74% hydrogen, 24% helium, and 2% other elements. This is largely unchanged since the beginning of our solar system. And as the hydrogen is used up, it actually gets hotter rather than colder. Surprisingly enough, there's no problem there. Uh, it's basically because of the, of the physics of the sun. Don't ask me to go into it. I'm a biologist. And I'm neither a biologist nor an astronomer, but I can still take a moment to give a simple explanation as to why the sun gets hotter as it converts hydrogen to helium. Our star is powered by protons fusing in the helium nuclei inside its core. This fusion is caused by gravitational pressure. As this process continues, there are less and less free particles available for fusion, which causes the core of the sun to shrink. The more the core shrinks, the more pressure exists within the core. The increased pressure increases the rate of hydrogen fusion, thereby increasing the temperature and luminosity. There, that wasn't too hard. Now, continue. If the sun has evolved and is now, it was now nearly 40% brighter than it would have been four and a half billion years ago, which means basically 40% hotter. But if the Earth is four and a half billion years old, the Earth would have been a block of ice. So the geologists come up with various scenarios and say, well, we had lots of greenhouse gases to keep the Earth warm. Um, well, I'll some of them said, well, we did have kind of a snowball earth kind of situation. But these are kind of ad hoc uh, justifications to try and explain how life could possibly evolve while the earth was a block of ice because the sun was a good deal colder than it, w than it is now. And to get around the problem, you actually have to have the atmosphere evolving at the same rate the sun is evolving and life is evolving, so it all fits together. Which, if you ask me, is quite a big ask. An awful lot of coincidence has to take place for that to, do, to occur. More crap. He's just lying his ass off. Like I said, the sun has increased in luminosity slowly throughout its life. The snowball earth phase was not caused by our sun being cooler. That occurred only 790 to 630 million years ago. As for life, the atmosphere, and the sun coincidentally evolving together, the creationist Dr. Surtees is simply displaying his unwillingness to do any research. As the earth receives more energy from the sun, this energy alters the carbon and nitrogen cycles, which change the atmosphere. The change in the atmosphere affects the evolution of life on earth. There is no coincidence involved. The processes are intricately related. 
we do not currently have a good enough understanding of Earth's climate regulation to know how long it will take until Earth can no longer compromise for the increase in solar radiation, but all models agree that the Earth will be doomed to a Venus-like runaway greenhouse effect in about 3 to 4 billion years. Whereas if the sun is actually only 6,000 years old, the problem disappears. Okay, a 6,000-year-old sun makes your fake problem disappear. How does your 6,000-year-old model describe the formation of the solar system? There has been absolutely no counter-argument or theory presented. And there you have the baseless false dichotomy laid bare for all to see. And that's all the time I have for this video. Everything that I didn't fit in, I wrote on the sidebar. Thank you for watching, and once again, my name is J.R. Chadwick.